can um, uh, good afternoon everyone yeah thank you for having me over to present uh, today's presentation um so just let me start uh normally um I, I start by providing the context within which uh, I'm basing my investment strategy. And uh, very topical these days are uh, really three things. Uh, the first is that, yeah, uh, the first issue that's very much talked about these days, obviously, is the impact of COVID-19 uh, and the disruption that it has caused uh, globally in terms of uh, supply chain and also the economic impact. Um, and specific to Malaysia, we've seen a uh, sudden, if somewhat abrupt, uh, unexpected change in government, uh, where about a month ago, there was a, a leap, uh, rather, uh, some MPs uh, um, forming new alliances that basically pushed up the previous Pakatan Harapan coalition. And that brought about uh, some uncertainties in terms of uh, policies. And also questions have been asked about whether, how um, secure, or how stable this government might be going forward. Can it stand the, for example, a test of no confidence vote if it was uh, carried out? So um, that was the second um, issue that uh, impacted the market in Malaysia. And the third one is also very, very important, the collapse in oil price. Um, when we started the year, we based our forecast on rent uh, being traded at about an average of 60 uh, US dollars a barrel. Um, given the recent developments in the oil market, we have uh, pared that down to 40 US dollars. And what's worrying is that, you know, nowadays you're talking about, you're seeing Brent at about just over 20 US dollars. And that will have a very um, adverse impact on Malaysia because the uh, federal government uh, fiscal revenue is highly dependent on oil and gas. Um, to be specific, um, when oil was trading at around 60 US dollars, um, it accounts for about 20 to 25 percent of our fiscal revenue. And uh, we estimate that for every 10 dollars drop in Brent, that would impact uh, the government revenue by about 5 billion ringgit. And uh, based on 40 dollars that is now uh, the that there's based on forty dollar difference that we've uh, seen so far this year, that will translate to about twenty billion hit to the government, and that's quite a bit because in terms of uh, percentage revenue, that's about one point three percent of GDP. So th those are basically the three main uh, concerns that is actually troubling the market at the moment. So I'll try and expand on these things as I go along. Um, okay, given the weakness in the market and the economy in general, the government has uh, responded by um, implementing a stimulus package that is very, very huge. Um, this this 20, 250 billion stimulus was announced last, uh, last Friday, yes. Uh, the number looks very huge on the surface. 250 billion ex far exceeds what the government had uh, implemented in the last two crises, compared to, say, for example, the uh, the Great Financial Crisis in 2008 and 2009. Um, the amount, uh, the package was about 67 billion then, um, almost. 20, yeah, almost 20 years ago, during the Asian financial crisis, the amount spent was just 7 billion. So this time around, it looks very, very huge, 250 billion, and that's about 17% of Malaysia's GDP. Um, 
but actually, in terms of the um, direct fiscal funding, it's only about 25 billion actually, because uh, much of the stimulus package draws on the resources of uh, uh, areas outside the government, for example, uh, the banks. Uh, they also draw on support from the utilities, uh, the insurers, and also on the um, savings, the retirement savings of the people. Now, in terms of the banks, for example, um, the central bank here, Bank Negara Malaysia, has uh, implemented a moratorium on um, outstanding loans that uh, might face difficulties after April. Um, so the amount of loans that's been estimated involved in this moratorium is about 100 billion. And then there is another 50, um, 50 billion or so in the form of uh, credit guaranteed provided by the government. This is to help the small and medium enterprises to uh, uh, borrow to fund their working capital. So that's about 50 billion there. And then another 50 billion comes in the form of uh, um, sort of uh, approval to withdraw from uh, EPF. Um, the government has allowed 500 ringgit to be withdrawn monthly from account two for the next six months. Um, that's one. And then also they announced that um, if um, employees choose can chooses, they can reduce their contribution by four percent, and so all that comes up to about to be about fifty billion. Um, so those three items actually form the bulk of this stimulus package. Now, in terms of the actual uh, uh, direct fiscal injection by the government, it comes to only twenty five billion, as you can see in this table here. Now, what's significant to us here is this one, the, ban, uh, the Bantuan Prihati National, which is basically a cash handout. Uh, it amounts to about 10 billion. And uh, it covers both the bottom 40 as well as the middle 40 segment of the, of the society. And I think this will go a long way in uh, helping uh, people, uh, you know, meet their daily sustenance, for example, those who are actually having, uh, whose livelihoods have been affected by the COVID-19. Um, there's also about 6 billion here, which is wage subsidy. Uh, here, the government would subsidize wages, I think the number is six, 600 ringgit per employee. Uh, for those who work for companies that, that are facing uh, a, you know, a uh, sharp decline in sales uh, by 50% from the start of the year. And then um, 2 billion is being spent on small scale projects. These are mainly targeting at rural uh, developments. So these are some of, and then the smaller, smaller portions will go to uh, providing discounts to, for telecom services, electricity subsidies and so forth. And in terms of the impact on the GDP as a result of the COVID-19 mess, uh, what we've done was that we have uh, reduced our GDP growth forecast from 3.1% previously to minus 1.9%. So in effect, we are you know, calling this year as a recessionary year. Uh, we think that the economy will contract by close to 2%. And then uh, the budget deficit uh, will widen further from minus 4.3% previously to minus 4.9%. And this assumes that the government will be able to cover some of the uh, uh, extra spending that they need to spend. Uh, the 25 billion I'm talking about here. A uh, large portion of that will be covered by special dividend from Petronas, for example or increased dividend payouts by GLCs or asset sales. We are not sure whether this will happen, but we think that suddenly a special dividend by Petronas uh, to the tune of say 30 billion is possible because Petronas does have a net cash of about 82 billion in their balance sheet. So 
the last time uh, Petronas was called upon to pay a special dividend was in the year 2018 when they paid 30 billion. So we won't be surprised if you know a similar sum is dished up again. Now, now if the government doesn't uh, fund the uh, stimulus by extraordinary income and goes to the market, bond market, then we could see this budget deficit uh, reach something closer to 6%. Um, and just for comparison, in 2009, the budget deficit was uh, minus 6.7%. So, you know, we have reached that kind of scale before in the past. And in 2008, so sorry, 2009, um, Malaysia's uh, growth was minus 1.5%. So we are, we are looking at something quite similar to, to, to 10 years ago. Now, uh, I think almost every sector of the economy is going to be impacted in a bad way uh, as a result of this. Uh, the supply chain disruption has caused almost every segment of the economy to contract. And even before uh, the impact of COVID-19 or the oil price crash set in, Malaysia was already on a, a weakening path uh, in terms of economic growth. Um, in the early part of February, uh, when Bank Nagara released the fourth quarter uh, GDP numbers, it was uh, it disappointed. Uh, in, you know, you, you came below expectations. Um, and that was uh, on account of lower agricultural output. So even in the fourth quarter of last year, we saw uh, output of uh, palm oil, for example, coming off already. And that was a consequence of uh, very, very low prices that uh, Malaysia suffered uh, for much of 2019. And because prices of, you know, CPO were so low, I think at one point it went down to as low as 1,008. A lot of the small planters couldn't make ends meet because their production costs were higher. Uh, they are less efficient than the big ones, so they underfertilized, uh, you know, their, their uh, the farms and and, and uh, didn't really harvest as much as they used to. So as a result, production was badly affected, and also the there was tree stress by dry weather and so forth. So even before COVID nineteen, uh, agriculture was a weak point. And mining too. Mining, uh, all, all was uh, all prices weren't that great last year, either. and so the output for oil was, was also affected. So it looks as though that for 2020 we're going to see uh, much of the same in terms of these two sectors. And because of uh, supply chain disruption, I think our electronic manufacturers also will at least suffer temporary uh, output shrinkage as well. So we are seeing a pretty dire first quarter, but for the year as a whole, we're looking at 1.9% contraction. Now, uh, in terms of the uh, Malaysian stock market, so this chart shows you what's happened so far this year. Well, the, the stock market really came off in a big way after Chinese New Year, um, well, after mid-February to be precise. And quite characteristic of markets when there's a big uh, risk of uh, situation, uh, you, we see uh, small caps suffering the most. So your, your FBM uh, SC here is the FBM small cap. And year to date, the index has fallen something like 38%. Um, the large cap is represented by FBM KLCI. There are 30 components in that index, uh, fell about 16% year to date. And those in between would be your mid cap, the FBM 70 went down to 27%. Uh, then the Islamic share index was down slightly less than the KLCI by 17%. So there was clearly a risk of, uh, risk of environment. 
Um, this chart shows you uh, the, the fact that the KLCI after the you know the collapse have, is this really cheap in terms of uh, 12 month forward price to earnings ratio. The five lines there, the linear lines is an indication indication of uh, the uh, the various levels of uh, PE. The, this, this line here, the 15.9 times is the mean, the average 12-month uh, forward PE that KLCI is accustomed to based on the last five years, past five years history. Um, based on past five years statistics, right, the 12-month forward mean for KLCI is 15.9 times. Now, 15 times is actually two standard deviation below that mean where we are today is trading at 14 times. So we are saying that it is trading even below two standard deviation uh, below mean. Um, and this 14 times is based on uh, EPS, which we have cut recently. A quarter ago, we were looking at 2020 EPS for the FBM KLCI to be at around 102.4 cents. Uh, after this, uh, you know, COVID and all price collapse incidences, we have uh, reduced that EPS from uh, 102.4 to 87.2, which is a 15% reduction. Now, 87.2 is about 8.4% lower than uh, what was achieved in 2019. So we are seeing an EPS, EPS contr contraction for this current year. And even for 2021, we've reduced our expectations by 9%. So cuts all around. And the sectors that suffered most were the banks, uh, the oil and gas sector and the gaming. Now, um, the banks, I think we reduce earnings mainly on account of uh, the more than aggressive, a very aggressive um, uh, cut in OPR by the central bank. Uh, in fact, when we started this year, we expected only 25 basis point cut. But seeing the way things are developing, uh, it seems almost consensual now that um, the, the OPR cut is likely to look more like 100 basis points this year. So that's going to crimp uh, the net interest margins of banks. So that's the main reason why banks are being downgraded uh, downgrade in terms of uh, earnings expectations. And then we also have to provide for greater impairments realistically this year. Um, for oil and gas, um, because oil price is so lousy now, um, there's less incentives for you know exploration activities and so forth. We think that Petronas is going to cut capex by quite a fair bit this year. And that will affect the prospects for the upstream operators. Uh, we were early this year quite bullish on OSVs and uh, the, uh, the, the, the drill rig providers, but uh, it doesn't seem to be the case anymore. Um, gaming, uh, where the big component here would be the two Gentings, Genting Burhan and Genting Malaysia. We've also cut uh, our earnings expectation by quite a lot. Uh, because almost all their casinos everywhere are being disrupted uh, by lockdown issues and so forth. And specific to Genting Malaysia, we felt that um, the uh, investment into Empire Resorts was a very, very bad investment. Uh, and just last couple of weeks, uh, Genting Malaysia had to pump in more money uh, into the investment. And, and I don't think that that's the last of it. I think they're going to there'll be more cash calls by Empire Resorts. So that's going to be a cash train for uh, getting Malaysia. Uh, plantations is the only bright spark um, where we see growth this year, despite, uh, well, when the uh, supply disruption issues uh, dies off, I think, um, you know, plantations is going to look a little bit more, it's going to look better. Um, we are basing 
our CPO price to average at about 2006 this year compared to 2002 uh, last year. Okay, uh, the question that I get asked very often these days is uh, where is the floor? Uh, how low can the market go? And uh, I try to offer an explanation by saying, uh, let, let's look at uh, what valuations were we trading at during the last crisis. And by this, I mean, let's look at 2008, um, the, the, the great financial crisis, yeah. Now, as you can see from this chart, the one on the left is a, a chart of the price to book value of the KLCI, uh, where today we are trading at about 1.2 times. Uh, sorry, this is actually at 1220. Uh, the level of CI here is at 1220. At 1220, it was trading at a, a price to book value of 1.2 times. And that matches exactly the low that was experienced in uh, 2008, which was also 1.2 times. Now, 1998 was the worst crisis. Uh, you know, the, the, the price of book value was about 0.64 thereabouts. So I don't think you can, I don't, I don't, I think it's highly and highly unlikely that we will visit 0.64. So if we base on the experience of 2008, then I would say that at 1220, we are about there, we are at the floor. And also, um, if you look at the ROE's return on equity of the KLCI, uh, we've dropped to around about 8.8% today. And that also matches where we were in 2008. So on, on these observations, I think uh, a price to book value of 1.2 times is pretty much it. That's where the fundamental support is. And uh, those who are well-versed in technicals will, will be familiar with this chart. This is actually a Fibonacci retracement chart. Uh, it also tries to locate where, sorry, 1,220 12, 12, 12, 12, is. Now, uh, the 62% retracement, right, uh, puts the CI at 1238. So what I'm offering you here is that 1220, not only is it a fundamental support, but it's also a, a technical support, the 62% 60, uh, retracement level support. Um, and if um, you stretch the, if you use the period from 1995 to, you know, today, um, and um, your question is, if 1220 was breached, uh, you know, it falls through 1220, where else can we, can we fall to? Then uh, according to the Fibonacci retracement uh, uh, techniques, right? The next uh, level below that would be 1090. Uh, and failing that, it would be uh, around close to 900. But I think these two levels are highly unlikely, in my opinion, because that would indicate a more stressed situation. Um, I think this time is, I think it's fair to say that the banks are a little bit more secure today than you know, where, where we were in the past. Because the, uh, in terms of capital adequacy, they are a lot better capitalized today. And also the central bank has already preempted uh, uh, the systemic deterioration by introducing the uh, moratorium. Um, but hopefully we will see that this COVID uh, driven crisis will subside substantially within six months. I think if it continues beyond six months, that, that's where the banking system will see another round of high very stressed situation. I think, um, um, well, at the end of the day, what I'm trying to tell you here is that I think 
um, the probability of a systemic crisis as a result of what, what's happening today is, I think, quite remote still at this point in time. Um, okay, um, moving on to the COVID uh, developments, right? The other question I get asked is, uh, uh, what, what else do I, what, what do I see, uh, what do I look for uh, to, to have a sense of when markets will bottom? Um, then the answers to that question would be, let's look at the, um, um, the number of cases that develops. Um, and, you know, based on, okay, Korea, China and Korea are the two countries that uh, were, the, were early in, in, in dealing with this uh, COVID crisis. And uh, looking at the experience of China and Korea, right? One gets the sense that um, the number of cases, new cases, seems to have diminished quite substantially in about two months after the start of the, uh, the numbers. For example, if you look at China, um, the new cases start to show quite, uh, start to show quite significantly in the uh, early part of January. And by the end of February, I think the numbers were quite small already. So in Korea as well, um, you know, the numbers started to build up from middle of February, but you know, after, you know, come, come March, middle of March, you saw those numbers coming up quite a bit. So, so you see, that, I think it's safe to say that, you know, for the two countries here, Two months on, uh, the number of cases have diminished quite a bit. So now, let's look at you know the the other countries, especially the, those in the West, uh, which are lagging in terms of the, uh, the dealing with this crisis. Um, Italy uh, seems to be peaking after more than a month, uh, whereas US is still in the early stages of uh, building up uh, in terms of the numbers. So I think it's very, very important to monitor the number of new cases in the US uh, because that's what's going to shape the, um, the numbers globally. So uh, my feeling is that uh, if we can be sure that the numbers in the US have peaked, then and only then will the market regain some, some composure. So in terms of timing, my guess, I suppose, would be, you know, um, probably by end of April, seeing that, you know, uh, the, the, the cases started to build up since the early part of March. So you give it about two months, then hopefully we see a peak sometime in April. Okay, then. That about COVID. Now moving on to other things. Uh, what what further responses can the government uh, do uh, going forward after the stimulus that they announced last 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 week? Um, I think what they need to address, uh, and this and this is especially after hopefully after the COVID uh, nineteen issue subsides is that they need to accelerate the implementation of infrastructure projects, which has been stalled for quite a while, uh, um, especially ERL and also the Penang Transport Master Plan. These two uh, projects were announced to go ahead by the previous government. Um, Penang Transport Master Plan, for example, it's uh, something close to 30 billion. Um, and we've reached a stage where the, previous, the federal government had agreed to give the state government a guarantee on the bonds to proceed with the construction of the LRT. Now, with the new government coming in, uh, one hopes that you know they will honour that, uh, that 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 uh, the guarantee, and so that they can proceed with it. ECRL has been held back. Partly because it's a Chinese-driven project, uh, the, the uh, uh, 
contractors are heading in is the, the, the Chinese party, so they've been held back because of the COVID thing. But uh, hopefully by the second half of this year, we can see a resumption of that. MRT3 is, uh, you know, is to follow MRT2. MRT2, the underground tunneling is supposed to complete by the middle of the year. And um, hopefully by the second half of this year, we'll be able to hear news regarding the uh, approval for MRT3 to go ahead. And the other one that's being, uh, that's being held back was the JD Singapore Rapid Transport System as well. Um, don't be surprised if, uh, you know, uh, more is called upon uh, by EPF contributors to, you know, uh, or rather, let's put it this way, Maybe the government might extend the period uh, uh, for which, during which the members can, you know, withdraw money. Um, for example, uh, in the stimulus package that was announced last week, the government allowed uh, members to withdraw 500, up to 500 from account two up to December. So if the situation does not improve, uh, won't, don't, we won't be surprised if that's thing is, they'll, they'll, if that is extended. Um, and then also the wage subsidy it was uh, extended. For, it was only offered for three months, but maybe uh, they may extend for another three months to six, for example. And then after the recovery, uh, we think it hi highly likely that the government is going to reintroduce GST. Um, in terms of the risks that they could be ahead, uh, we are looking at uh, a potential uh, removal of Malaysia from um, several indices. Now, ever since China became a, a prominent global market, um, its presence in international benchmark indices have been have grown. And that has the effect of crowding out some of the other uh, regional markets and Malaysia included. For example, uh, you know, and the JP, the JP Morgan uh, government bond index emerging market. Um, in this particular index, Malaysia, Malaysia has seen a reduction uh, in, uh, in this index uh, because of China's entry. So we are seeing a, a phase uh, reduction of uh, Malaysia in this index, which would lead to an outflow of uh, foreign funds from, from, from this index. And what we're monitoring closely is the decision by FTSE Russell as to whether they will uh, uh, drop us from the World Government Bond Index. Uh, I think, it, you know, the, the last, in, during the last review in September, they kept us in the watch list. So uh, hopefully they will keep us in so that there will not be further outflows of uh, funds from the capital markets here. Now, in terms of uh, sector recommendations, uh, this, this is what we have. Um, we are overweight consumer. Uh, technology, rubber gloves, telecoms, media, construction, and property. Um, in terms of uh, portfolio construction, right, right, we are recommending that uh, clients adopt a barbell approach in the sense that, you know, on the one end, um, you know, do populate your, your portfolio with uh, defensive names, especially those in the consumer sector um, and, and maybe the dividend yielders. The reason why we like consumer as defensive is because, yeah, actually we're talking about consumer that deals with essential goods, the basic goods, uh, goods which uh, prove to be uh, still in demand, even in a recessionary environment. So we're talking about things like F&N, 
Uh, we're talking about things like Padini that deals with value for money, clothing. Um, we're talking about uh, QR resources. QR resources is uh, the franchise holder of Family Mart here. It's very, very successful in Malaysia. And they, they are, their products are quite well diversified. You know, they're talking about um, suri, they, they actually deal with surimi, which is a fish, fish paste. Um, they also deal with uh, poultry products, which, which is actually goods which are highly resilient in, 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 in times of trouble. And the last one would be power root, uh, which is actually uh, dealing with cough, coffee. Um, now, if you look at consumer names, those four names I talk about, f and n Padini, Power Root, QR Resources, I think two things stand out for us. Uh, first is that these uh, consumer stocks generate attractive returns on equities. Um, you know, based on the last sort of six years numbers, right, we, we noted that uh, Every one of them has uh, exceeded the KLCI's return re return on equity, except for Power Root in, when when they had one bad year in 2018, right? But you, when you look at the ROE, say they are they're superior. And also in terms of uh, correlation to the overall market, they are lowly correlated. Uh, their coefficient of correlation is well below half. In fact, uh, you know. The, the highest one here is uh, F and N, which is about 0.3. So uh, what I'm trying to say here is that you know they are very good diversifiers for those who uh, you know have diversified portfolios. These are effective diversifiers. And the next couple of few slides here are details of. Uh, uh, those four names that I have mentioned are, are kind of top picks for the uh, in this kind of market. Power Root gives you very good dividend yields. The uh, this 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 stock gives you about five to six percent yield. It's got a net cash balance sheet, and um, their earnings are driven by um, a very efficient uh, distributor network. Now they have diversified their market to include overseas, such that now export uh, accounts for fifty percent of uh, total sales, and they are beneficiary from a weakening uh, ringgit. Uh, Padini is uh, a dealer in uh, value for money clothing. Uh, they have grand outlet stores in Malaysia as well. They are in the net cash position and also a great dividend. Gain. Yield of six percent. Um, well, they 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 definitely will be a victim of the current MCO that we're facing, um, you know, and and the uh, disruption to 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 the retail market. But um, they are also receiving the benefits of the stimulus package uh, in the form of, uh, for example. Uh, rental reductions in the outlets within the malls. Um, they will also benefit from the lower electricity costs and also the wage subsidies. QL, I mentioned that, that I think the, the key point about QL is that um, um, you know, it's very rare to find this stock trading, uh, you know, Below eight, eight ringgit, at seven ringgit, thereabouts. This is actually a highly sought after stock, um, and it's being loved because uh, of the highly successful Family Mart franchise. Uh, in among convenience stores, Family Mart has is probably the, the most successful in Malaysia, and they've been around for over twenty years, uh, and you know they've been uh, a great deliverer of earnings, and we are, we are looking at the growth of about. Even in these challenging times, I think once the COVID-19 uh, issue is out of the way, uh, we are looking at a uh, growth of about you know 13%, 10, 10 to 13% a year for the next three years. 
Now, FNN, um, they have a very highly successful uh, Thai operations uh, where it now makes up about 70% of the group's operating profit. They recently went into upstream, uh, uh, buying, buying up farmlands uh, to increase uh, production of uh, fresh milk. Um, and it's uh, because of the correction in uh, uh, price, it's not trading below the mean, below its mean valuation of 24 times. So we, we reckon that, uh, you know, there's uh, about 15% upside from here to its fair value target of 35. Um, okay, for a more aggressive uh, mix, you may want to consider buying into technology. Uh, we reckon that uh, it's, well, it's being temporarily disrupted by supply chain issues, right? But uh, once this normalizes, I think the, um, the earnings will return in an aggressive way. Um, I think in Malaysia, our technology sector uh, benefits from three things. Number one, um, a lot of the uh, manufacturers here are beneficiaries of trade diversion as a result of the tensions between US and China trade. Uh, secondly, um, it's also a beneficiary of uh, growing semiconductor content in automotive markets. Uh, the two names here I want to highlight, one is uh, DNO and the other one is Kesem. These two names, uh, more than 90% of their sales is dependent on uh, automotive demand from Europe and China. Now, as you know, uh, there is increased stringency in terms of uh, emission standards for Europe and to certain extent China as well. And, and as a result, there is a uh, electric vehicles are gaining market share. And these vehicles have high semiconductor content in, in the build up. So, uh, Kesem and DNO are two companies here in Malaysia that uh, sells LEDs uh, uh, components to, to, to these um, industries. So they will benefit from, from that development. Um, last, I just want to show you the last uh, slide here. Maybe I'll just go straight to the last slide. Um, uh, these are our top picks. Um, DNO, FNN, uh, Harta Lega. I, yeah, this one I have not mentioned yet, but maybe I can just uh, mention that Harta Lega is a uh, rubber glove manufacturer. To us, it's the best uh, many, uh, rubber glove uh, manufacturer in Malaysia. And, uh, and rubber glove is one of those uh, sectors, rare sectors that is thriving on this pandemic and is benefiting from very active restocking activities. So we conservatively estimate that Harta Liga can deliver 9% uh, EPS growth this year and next. Uh, and its expansion is comfortably funded by internal resources because they, are, um, net, they, are, they have a net cash balance sheet and also their operating cash flows are, are pretty strong. Then we have uh, Kesem, I mentioned that that's the uh, tech, tech player that services the auto demand for, for semiconductors. Uh, media Chinese is the media play. Uh, this, this one is being offered as a technical buy. Um, I think the thing to say about Media Chinese is that it's got 16 uh, cent per share net cash. And it's trading only at 16 and a half, uh, 16.5 cents. So almost the entire market cap is, is actually cash and you get the rest for free, basically. Uh, and we think that it can comfortably give a net dividend of 9% this year. Um, and the last one I want to have highlight would be Telecom Malaysia. This is the uh, 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 GLC. 
uh, at 352, it trades at a level where dividend yields is about 3%. This is based on about 60% payout. We reckon that because it's a GLC and the government needs money, uh, they may be called upon to increase their dividend payout. So we won't be surprised if uh, they pay out something closer to 100% this year, which means that you know, the dividend could go up to easily 5% in terms of yields. And they have the widest uh, you know, fiber optic infrastructure network in Malaysia, and they're well placed to uh, uh, tap on the growing 5G deployment opportunities uh, here in this country. So in a nutshell, these are the you know, top 10 names that we recommend uh, in these very challenging times. It's half of it are actually very defensive, the other half are more aggressive. Um, so I think I will end the presentation there and uh, look at the questions and try and answer some of them. Thanks, Mr. Cole. Um, we will go ahead and take questions from the attendees now. Mr. Ko, can you find the questions in the Q&A tab? I'll give a minute. Sure. Okay, yeah, hang on, just let me look at them. Okay. Okay, maybe I look at the first one. Um, I think there's a Benjamin Wong who asked, how sure uh, are we that the banks will continue to perform on the COVID issue? Uh, can we invest? And which fund and when is the best timing? Well, as I say, I think uh, this time around, the banks are well capitalized. Um, they have sufficient buffer. I I can't remember the numbers, but the last time uh, Bank of Garrett did a stress test, I believe that uh, you know the the conclusion was that uh, you know the, the there is sufficient buffer there to absorb uh, a highly stressed scenario without having to resort to uh, cash calls, for example. Um, so on that basis, I think. The, um, the sector is pretty secure, um, but if there are concerns over the veracity of such uh, assertions, then I think the uh, the bank, the safest bank to me would be public bank, um, and public bank has come off uh, by by a fair bit. So if you have to invest in a bank, uh, and also to be safe about the investment, then I think public bank would be my my, my choice. Um, and when is the best timing? As I say, if you look at the downside to this market, uh, the fundamental support is at 1220, which is the price to book uh, multiple of 1.2 times, which is the level last seen in the in the 2008 crisis. So there's only a downside of 100 points from here. So we're not far from the bottom. And I think now is the best time to pick up stocks if you want to look at, you know, buying, buying. Um, Another question I asked is, was asked is, the, does the government have so much fund for the next planned infrastructure since they have just announced the 25 billion stimulus package? That's a very good question. Um, the, okay, the resources which the government can draw upon um, to fund the stimulus package would be uh, Petronas, Petronas has a net cash balance sheet of 82 billion. Um, and they may be called upon again to pay a special division of 30 billion. Um, that would help, you know, close the gap quite a bit. Um, 
so far, what the government has uh, uh, announced has been, or rather the previous government actually, um, was the, or the ECRL to go ahead, the uh, Penang Transport Master Plan, as well as the, um, the Clank Valley uh, double tracking as well. So I think if the government can have these three projects uh, take off in a, or rather continue, uh, that will help to restore some activity in the construction sector. Um, you know, the, uh, I think, for example, the high speed rail, which is 40 billion, is actually uh, uh, a, a very large amount which may not be able, be able to be funded by the government. But uh, what we believe is that based on ECRL, uh, the Inland Transport Master Plan, the Clang Valley Double Tracking and the RRT, if these can be continued, which I think likely will be the case, then uh, you, know, you can see construction activity supporting the, the, the economy as a whole. So uh, I think in terms of uh, adequacy of funding for these projects, I think they've been accounted for already. So those, those actually probably can still go ahead without additional strain to the, gov the government's balance sheet. Okay, one question is, uh, what is your take on rubber glass industry in this economic climate? I think the rubber glass industry is uh, uh, a try is an industry that's thriving in this environment. It is considered an essential service, not sorry, an essential product rather. Uh, and the rubber glove manufacturers are not impacted by this movement control order because uh, they, you know, their products are considered essential. So therefore the factories can continue running as, as normal. And uh, the feedback we've been getting from some of the manufacturers has been that there is actually a, uh, a backlog of demand because there, there's suddenly a surge in, in demand for rubber gloves that, uh, you know, uh, yeah, uh, orders have, have basically multiplied and uh, the, the lag time for delivery has also lengthened already. So prospects are looking very, very good for them. And um, but the rubber gloves also another uh, Another advantage for rubber gloves is that, you know, because it's priced in US dollar and the ringgit has been weakening 7% this year so far. And you, it wouldn't surprise me if the, against the US dollar, the, the, the ringgit continues to weaken. The rubber gloves players will be a beneficiary of this situation as well. So, uh, yeah, our top pick is Harta Leka. Um, and Kostan will be our next one, our second favorite. Okay, I got a question from uh, about EQL. Um, the question is, are you sure you're recommending QL that has a PE of uh, 59 times during such, a, you know, such an environment? Is Family Mart such a small percentage of their business? Well, um, QL had always been trading at a very high PE uh, close to 50 times, yeah, it's true. Um, it, it's, it's a characteristic of um, the company that investors have become accustomed to. Um, the reason for this is that it's actually a very well-run business. Um, that's number one. Number two, uh, the business is actually very, very diversified. Uh, is dealing in products which are defensive. We are talking about food, basic essentials. Um, I mean, this company has been listed since 1998. If you take the trouble to look at their track record, right, you'll be amazed at the kind of sustainability they've been able to maintain in terms of its earnings growth. Um, and 
the adventure into Panmimart has been a very, very successful endeavor. Um, and it won't surprise me that if, if in, you know, in three years time, we can list this uh, at a very, very uh, attractive value, valuation. So I think those, those are the reasons why uh, QL will continue to uh, be a favorite uh, stock, not just amongst uh, uh, the retailers, but also uh, the institutions as well. Okay, I've got a question from uh, Mr. Mark, Mike Toll. Why do we pick uh, property as an overweight? Well, the simple question to that, uh, so the simple answer to that is because it's very, very cheap, uh, very, very undervalued at the moment. Um, I, I think I understand why you're asking this question because you're concerned that uh, the market is very, very sluggish still in the property sector. I, I agree with you there, um, but you're talking about a sector where values are, be, are trading, you know, stocks are trading at about, you know, 0.3 times price to book. Um, you know, and if you try and value the assets and market, you know, it's trading at very, very low multiples to net asset values as well. So yes, we don't see much in terms of catalyst that could, uh, you know, kickstart kick the, the, the you know, just share prices, but, but uh, you know, prices are very, very cheap. And I think if you're a long-term holder, um, you know, you can, you should be able to uh, read very, very good rewards in, you know, uh, two, three years time. So that's, that in a nutshell, that's why we are overweight property. Not so much because we see any uh, catalyst in the near term, but because these are actually very long term, uh, they offer very long, good, very long, very good long term values.